Hello, and welcome to the introduction to ISET accreditation webinar. Uh, my name is Randy Bowman, and I am ISET's president and CEO. I'm pleased to be your host for today. Now that we have all the administrative information out of the way, let's get to the meat of why you're here and learn more about the process to become an ISET accredited provider. Thanks, Randy. And we're glad you're all here. Thank you very much for tuning in today and giving us part of your day. Um, as part of ISET's mission to accredit providers around the world that deliver quality learning and inspire continuous improvement, we bring you this webinar each month as an opportunity for you to gain an understanding of the application process, as well as to allow you the opportunity to ask a commissioner some of your questions. This webinar supports the ISET mission in providing you with the information you need to make a good decision about accreditation with ISET. The International Accreditors for Continuing Education and Training is a nonprofit accrediting body dedicated to enhancing the quality of continuing education and training. We provide a standardized framework for designing, developing, delivering, and evaluating training that organizations can follow to ensure that their training programs meet the highest standard in the industry. In addition to this webinar, ISET offers workshops, professional development webinars, downloadable resources, industry research, and more to organizations who are pursuing training accreditation, continuing education benchmarking, and process improvement. By the end of the webinar today, you'll be able to do the following. Identify the steps of the AP application process as we will walk you through all of the steps involved in accreditation. You'll also be able to list document requirement types for the initial and the renewal application. We'll give you a description and a couple of examples of each type of document. You'll be able to identify the location of additional resources available to applicants and you can plan for your next steps in the application process. We encourage you to take a moment at the end of this webinar to jot down next steps for you and your organization. These learning outcomes are provided today as a model exemplifying that any learning event should have learning outcomes that are compliant with the ISIT standard and that are smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and relevant, and time-bound. Now, I know that some people are already asking this question, so we'll go ahead and cover this at the very beginning. Applications for the 2023 standard are expected to be available later this summer. Right now, the, um, there are a couple of, there are three changes that were made to the, um, at the standard language, and it is out for public comment under the announcements tab on the website. You can go there and check it out if you would like to see what the language change was there. It does not have the whole standard out there. It just has those three pieces. If you have bought a 2018 application, you, typically you would have one year to submit that application. However, since this is the year of transition for us, because we have to be accredited by ANSI every five years, you will have 90 days from the published date of the new standard to submit your 2018 application. If for any reason you are not able to meet that deadline, then you will be given a 2023 standard and application bundle at no cost, an online application, and you can submit that application you will have the same deadline as your original 2018 application had. I hope that's clear. And of course, we'll take any questions in just a little bit. The standard and application are bundled together and those are available on the website for $495. The application review fee and annual maintenance fee are due upon submission of your application in the online portal. The initial application review fee is 4290 
the review fee for reaccreditation is reduced to $3,275. That annual maintenance fee is $1,095, and that's due each year. If you would like your application expedited, you can elect to pay an additional $1,650. And that cuts off you know, a day or two on your, your preview and then a week off of each review cycle. The application review fee includes the staff preview, the initial and second document review of the materials you'll provide by two ISEC commissioners, and then the accreditation interview, which will be a meeting with one of your assigned commissioners via Zoom. If a third review is required, there is an additional review fee of $450 for that final review. Upon submission of the application, it is previewed by staff for completeness. This will not be counted as a commissioner review and will not count against you. We will make every effort to have this preview complete in two to three business days. Once the application passes the staff preview, two commissioners are assigned. Each commissioner evaluates the application independently. Then the commissioners will consult each other throughout the remainder of the process. After the initial application review of 15 days, the commission will approve your application for an accreditation interview, or most likely it will come back for some additional information. Don't be alarmed, 95% of the applications go back after that first review, only because they may not be familiar with your industry or your language or your processes. So they'll probably ask a couple of questions, just some clarifying questions, and you'll have 10 days to submit that response. If the first two reviews do not answer the commission's questions, the third and final review will take place and requires an additional fee of $450. Now, what can you expect during that accreditation interview? When the, the administrative commissioner notifies you that your organization has been approved, the interviewing commissioner will send you a message through our accreditation management system, the AMS, offering you three dates and times. The interview is designed to be as non-intrusive as possible and should not involve more than a few people within your organization. Because we are conducting virtual accreditation interviews, the AMS will display a link to a Zoom meeting for the agreed upon time and date. The tone of the accreditation interview is conversational and collaborative. During the interview, your interviewing commissioner will be sharing with you information that confirms what you are, what you are doing well. After going through the review process, the accreditation interview is the time to discuss opportunities for improvement. The commissioner will not act as a consultant for your company. However, he or she may make recommendations for improvements during the interview, and these will be included in your final report. The commissioner may offer general impressions and comments about factual matters, but cannot offer interpretations and opinions about the final decision of the commission. The commissioner must complete a report of his or her findings and forward it to the administrative commissioner who completes the final report. The report is then sent to you regarding the decision of the commission. If you have any questions about what to expect during the accreditation interview, and we haven't answered them here, you can always call our offices 703-763-0705. My extension is 102. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And we'll put, we'll put that information out back out later. The application is broken up into sections and each section asks for a policy, process, or evidence. The application tells you what is required to be submitted. It's advisable to read through the entire application to have a clear picture of how it's organized before you begin to upload your documents. ISET does not prescribe how you should operate your learning organization. However, we ask that you address these elements within the application 
to ensure that you are offering high quality learning events. They provide organizations with the framework to adhere to quality, quality continuing education and training practices. Here's one of the key takeaways from today's webinar. Commissioners need to see what actual audience sees. For example, if the documentation is for personnel and or contractors, it should be written with them in mind. If the documentation is public facing, it should be written in such a way to provide direction to your learners. Now I'd like to introduce you to Kevin Perry, He's a veteran commissioner and it's great to have you here today, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Well, hello everybody. Thanks again for tuning in. Glad uh, that you're spending time with us today. I'm going to spend a good part of my time with you describing the three types of documents that you heard Karen allude to a minute ago, uh, which are documents you'll need to submit in your application. And those again are policies, processes and evidence. So accreditation involves submitting these types of documents throughout the application, which are designed to show that your organization is in compliance with the entire ISET standard. So let's start with policies. Policies provide important communications to both internal and external stakeholders, such as instructors, administrators, and learners on the expectations of participating with the organization in a learning experience. And as you see on the slide, policies guide, influence, and determine decisions or actions, and they define scope, roles, and responsibilities within your learning program. Another way to state it is that policies are documents that provide an organization with the primary principles and tenets for how it conducts its business, how employees should conduct themselves, and what your customers can expect. So let's take a look at the critical elements in a policy and what we as commissioners look for as we review them. So the components of well-written policies include first, dates of adoption and revision. A policy should be current and the format should include a version control system where the original effective date, along with the dates for any changes to the policy are recorded. And incidentally, all policies as well as processes must be in place for at least three months before submitting an accreditation application. And commissioners will look to verify this by looking at the effective date on each policy. Second, approval and or owners. Who is responsible for the policy and who enforces it? Is there someone different who approves the policy? The commissioner evaluating your application will want to see that your organization has identified the person or role responsible for the policy and who enforces it. A good policy will also designate the policy owner if that happens to be different from the approver. Next is the description or purpose, which is about what is the business need for this policy. The description or purpose is the narrative that describes the policy and the need for it, that is the why. However, the description is not the actual policy, but instead introduces the policy and explains why it exists in the first place. The description can, can show the relationship between the policy and the broader organizational mission. Standards and definitions. It's possible you may have policies that include terms that are specific to your organization or industry. These should be defined to ensure all users understand what they mean. And then finally, consequences of non-compliance. So what happens if the policy is violated or breached? It's good practice, therefore, for policies to include the details for reporting any violations and the consequences of the breach. And as mentioned earlier, who is responsible for enforcement? And in terms of length, you know, a policy does not have to be a large, overly detailed document. Instead, often shorter is better as there is less left to interpretation. However, it's essential to keep in mind that the policy is not the process or procedure required to implement it. So the accreditation application requires about eight of these policies along with evidence that they're being communicated 
to learners or acknowledged by the appropriate personnel on your staff. Here are a couple sample policies that were located on the internet. So you can see things like the effective date, the revision number, who it's approved by, the purpose, the scope, and so on. So now that we've covered policies, let's turn our attention to the next type of document required, which are your process documents. ISAT accreditation requires you to submit written processes that explain how you manage your organization. And while evaluating the application for accreditation, the ISAT commissioners will expect your process documents to include the following, an introduction or overview, this is the process objectives, the description of the process, why it is needed and when it is performed. Responsible parties. So the position assigned to the task, and it should appear, uh, th this position by the way, should also appear on your organizational chart. Inputs and outputs. So this refers to what is needed by way of say data or information to execute the process and perform the steps. Uh, what reports, checklists, or other documentation is produced because of following the procedures. So those would be your outputs. For example, a process on how you analyze your learning events for effectiveness and ongoing improvement. The inputs might be the course evaluation summary results that are stored in your LMS. And an output might be a report that is emailed or somehow shared with instructors and other stakeholders. Then we have the procedures. So this is the sequence of activities that make up the process, the actual step-by-step -step instructions provided to an employee to be able to complete the process. And then finally, the tools. These are the tools used to complete the process. These can be things like checklists, templates, other forms, or perhaps even an LMS required to follow the procedures. If a process utilizes such a tool, a blank copy of that tool should be included at the end of the process document. Often this is shown as an appendix. And when it comes to evidence, you'll need to submit completed versions of these tools. So for example, if completing a checklist is a tool you use to ensure that uh, your learning environment meets your learning environment requirements, then you would submit an actual completed checklist as your evidence, not the blank checklist. Now, this is important. Every process shall explain the who, what, when, how, and with what tools, who does what, when or by when, how, and with what tools. Commissioners will examine each process and verify that all of these components are included. And if one is missing, for example, the when, commissioners will likely return the application and ask you to re resubmit a revised process. So make sure your process is complete and no matter who conducts the process, that the same outcome would result. Many organizations choose to represent processes by way of flowcharts. And you know, while a flowchart can be a useful part of the process document, for most organizations, it will not contain the level of detail needed by ISSET. The flowchart can give a useful overview of the process, but rarely can it contain the required level of detail alone. So it would not be best practice to submit only a flowchart to show a documented process. The flowchart can be a useful overview to help the organization identify the necessary steps or boxes that then get detailed in a more narrative style of document. So for ISAT accreditation, the process document must contain that more specific procedural level of detail. Again, the who, what, when, how, and with what tools. And like policies, all processes must be in place for a minimum of three months before submitting the application. This um, sample process that you see is a good example of a documented process. You can see it has fields for author and approver dates, the responsible parties, and a version control system. It 
also specifies the person responsible for executing the process, which again is the who, and then you can see the step-by-step -step procedure. And here's another um, sample process document with similar details. So writing these processes is an area where you'll spend a good deal of your time preparing to submit your accreditation application. All right, now that we've covered policies and processes, let's move to evidence, which is what you submit to verify that you're actually carrying out your policies and processes as you've written them. Where evidence is required in the application, it must be actual evidence that was produced during or as a result of following either your pro policy or process as described. For example, if a form or checklist is used to implement a process, again, the evidence you submit is an actual completed example of that form or checklist, not the blank template. Here are some other examples of evidence. So your process for how you communicate important information to the learner prior to the learning event might involve sending an email to learners after they register. You would submit an example of that email to an actual learner, again, not the template of the email. Could be pages or excerpts from a handbook or manual. In this case, we would ask that you highlight or somehow draw attention to the specific information you're asking commissioners to evaluate. If you submit a large document and leave it to the commissioners to hunt for what you want them to see, you do run the risk that we won't be able to find it and we'll end up returning your application asking for, for clarification. And by the way, you may redact any identifying information um, on evidence that you know would relate to uh, personal identity. Now the ISAT accreditation management system requires that you prepare evidence documents in PDF format in order to upload them as part of your application. So again, this is where you'll spend a great deal of your time locating and compiling your evidence. Let's move on to exemplary learning events. In the application, you'll be asked to identify at least two learning events and possibly a third one that will be used as the basis for evidence throughout your application. All through the ISAT application, you'll see this term learning event. So this is a term used to incorporate the wide range of event types that you as providers might be implementing. So, you know, there's, you have courses, workshops, programs, webinars. Learning event is the ISET term that encompasses all of those. Now, an exemplary learning event should be chosen from each delivery methodology that you use. And to save time, we would suggest you choose events for which you already have developed documentation. The events used as evidence should be representative of, of all the delivery methods used by your organization. And we're going to cover those in just a minute. So again, the application could include up to three exemplary, exemplary learning events if you use all three delivery methods that, I, that ISET specifies. You'll be expected to choose one exemplary course for each delivery method and these same exemplary course examples should remain consistent throughout your application. So here's what we mean by delivery methodologies. ISET classifies as, uh, delivery into three categories. Synchronous, where learners and instructors are engaged at the same time. So obviously classroom learning comes to mind, but this can also be virtual delivery using a platform such as Zoom, like we're using here today. Asynchronous, where learners engage on their own time. So on-demand, online, or e-learning are common descriptors used here. And then hybrid blended refers to a combination of the previous two. So for example, you might have a classroom course that requires some pre-work that learners access on their own time through your LMS prior to coming together in the classroom. The application requires examples of the learning events from your organization. And again, there should be one example from each method of delivery that you use to deliver your learning events. And again, please use the same exemplary courses throughout the application. 
All right, let's move to design documents. You'll need to present an instructional design document form of some type for your learning events. In the application, you will provide documentation and evidence for your learning events for which the procedures for compliance are being followed. If you haven't been using some sort of design document, ISET provides this document template that you see on the screen, which can be found under the resources tab, and you'll have access to that once you purchase the standard in the application bundle. But you, know, you don't have to use this exact form. If you do a web search on instructional design documents, you'll find a multitude of different examples. Just pick one that works best for your organization. But whatever design document you choose, it should include similar information to what you see here in the example. So that would be a module by module or section by section breakdown of the course with estimated or allotted times for each section a topical listing or description of the content covered in each module, the learning outcomes for each module, being sure to use those specific measurable verbs like the ones you see here and the ones uh, that Karen mentioned, a summary of the needs analysis that was conducted and the outcome of that analysis, which you can see covered in the written paragraph at the top, a description of the instructional materials and methods used in each module. And then finally, the method of learning assessment used in each module, ideally including the minimum performance criteria, such as, for example, a passing score of 70% on an exam, such as what you see here in the example. And as, and as you can see in the example, how these different components of the design document relate back to the standard. So that's what those clauses refer to. So once you have successfully become ISET accredited, you will want to maintain your accreditation. So each year you will conduct an organizational audit or internal review to ensure you remain compliant with the current standard and include the results in an online annual report that you submit to ISET. In addition, that annual report involves reporting statistics to ISED, such as the number of learners you serve, the number of CEUs you award, and any other continuous improvement and innovation steps that you've taken. This annual report will occur for years two, three, and four. When you submit your report on your accreditation anniversary date, you include payment for your annual maintenance fee. That was the 1,095 Karen mentioned. Accredited providers are required to keep their processes, policies, and other documentation current, particularly as updates to the standard occur, which occurs every five years. Now your ISET accreditation is also on a five-year cycle. So prior to the end of your fifth year as an accredited provider, you will be required to go through a reaccreditation process and then you'll do that again every five years. So to become reaccredited, you'll follow the same steps as you did to become initially accredited, but there are some discounts in terms of pricing for the reaccreditation application. So let me close by sharing some accreditation provider application tips that apply to both initial accreditation and reaccreditation. For simplicity and consistency reasons, we recommend you compile your policies and processes into a single policy and processes manual that is made accessible to your staff and other stakeholders. Also, write your policies and processes with the users in mind, not the ISET commissioners. These are designed to be working documents that are used by your staff or, or other stakeholders. And then, Try to adopt a templated format for these and use that consistently throughout. Uniformity makes it easier, easier not only for us commissioners, but also for the users of your policies and processes. And then finally, ensure that all policies, processes, evidence, and narratives are written in clear, concise, simple language. Be sure to include a version control system for your policy and process documents. And again, in your processes, 
describe who is responsible for doing what, when, how, and with what tools. Make sure your application is organized. Attachments or evidence must be inserted in the appropriate fields of the online application. And, and again, please highlight your PDFs with yellow highlighter in cases of large documents uh, to direct commissioners to what you want them to evaluate. So make it easier for your commissioners to find the information in your evidence, and that'll make your application process much easier as well. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm pleased to pass back to Randy. Thank you so much, Kevin and Karen. Um, that's very informative. So we're now at the question and answer part of the of the webinar today. We do have some questions that have already been um, entered. So we'll talk about those. But right now, if you do have any other questions that you want answered, um, now is the time to go ahead and put those in. Uh, so that we can make sure that we um, cover those. So to begin with, um, Kevin, the readiness calculator mentions org charts, job description, and resumes for CET personnel. Does this mean that certain sh uh, positions should be assigned CET duties? Well, the org chart should reflect every position that comprises your continuing ed organization. So that being said, um, yes, a a every position on the org chart should be a person that, you know, serves some role in your continuing ed organization. And as such, there should be um, a resume and a set of hiring requirements for, for each of those. Now, in cases where you might use contract instructors or other contracted resource, like maybe instructional designers, for example, you do not have to reflect those on your org chart as individual positions. You could just have a box saying contract instructors. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, are there specific metrics we should be considering when measuring the effectiveness of our development, administration, delivery, in support of our training? You want me to take this one, Kevin? <laughs> sure. Okay. All right. So basically what we're looking for here is how do you measure if your organization is effective? What is your mission statement? What do you measure? That's kind of what we're looking for here as far as, um, you know, maybe there are KPIs, key performance indicators that you measure each year, whatever that, that report is. Maybe you have an annual report that has to go to certain stakeholders. Anything that will show that here's what our mission is, here's what we did this past year, and this is how we know that we accomplished our mission. It may be measured in your customer satisfaction rate. It may be in completion rates. It may be in enrollments. It may be in dollars, revenue. It can be whatever it is for your organization. We work with so many different types of organizations that we really don't say what it needs to look like. It just needs to reflect how you measure the effectiveness of your organization, not just the courses, but how do you know that you're accomplishing your mission. Yeah, so just to give an example, if your mission is we train, um, we provide training to create the world's best widget makers. And so the question is, how do you know that you're creating the world's best widget makers? As Karen said, it might be the number of people you train. It might be how they score on your learning assessment. It might be um, some sort of industry data that you seek uh, among that population from employers and so forth. And, and don't be tempted to just submit um, an explanation that you use your course evaluations because that's what's covered in the course evaluation part of the standard. So that's what Karen meant by it's just not evaluating your courses. Awesome. Thank you for that. So we have um, two two questions about the workshop. I'm going to kind of combine them into one question for you guys. So um, one person wants to know what's in the accreditation workshop and 
Is that workshop required? No, but I wish it was. No, <laughs> um, only because it does help a lot of people understand the language, just like you have a language that you use at, at your organization. Um, ISET has language and, and we put that terminology in the new standard. But when we're talking about uh, evaluation versus assessment, things like that, um, how we measure, how you measure things, how you uh, write your policies and your processes, these are some of the things that we've talked about during this webinar that are very important. Um, and we wanna make sure that people understand what we are looking for exactly. In the workshop, we go all the way through the um, standard and make sure that you understand what exactly will the uh, standard and the application ask for and what, um, what will be valid evidence. Uh, what how, what does a good policy look like? What does a good process look like? And then we try to give you some examples, even more than we did today, but a lot more detail. It's because our base basically we want the people who um, are maybe doing accreditation for the first time. Um, we want them to feel very comfortable filling out the application and being successful with it. So we provide the workshop. A lot of times too, we're working with practitioners people who are very, very good at their job, but they may not have an academic or education background, but suddenly they're promoted to director of training or they're responsible for the training. We just wanna make sure that you have all the tools that you need to be successful with this accreditation process. It is not required, but it's highly recommended. When your feedback comes back, it's a lot less feedback. They're asking a lot less questions. Right. You get m many, many less findings uh, uh, if you've attended the workshop. So that's always good. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions again here for you guys, because um, I j the there's a confusion and I related. So I just want you guys to answer this. So can there be an ISET accredited courses or just ISET accredited training providers? And this other person says his organization has 30 courses, over 30 courses. Does every course need to go through um, the accreditation process or is it like a percentage? So I think those two questions are related. Yeah. So this is important. Um, ISET accredits your organization, does not accredit courses, programs, certificate programs, certifications. It accredits your organization. So the premise is that if you successfully prove that your organization adheres to all facets of the standard in terms of how you're structured, how you operate, how you design courses, deliver them, evaluate them, that you will be a high quality training organization. And as such, your courses will be good, uh, your programs will be good and so forth. Right, so think of it like, just like a manufacturing process, we are accrediting your learning and development, your instructional design processes and everything that goes through that. If you put the raw materials in, it goes through the process. You always get the same quality material then at the end, item at the end. Um, Randy, I just want to say, and the courses that follow the learning the events that follow those policies and processes and fall under that, not just the responsibility and control, but the instructional design everything that you submit in those piece, those um, sections, those courses are eligible, you may award CEUs for. Yeah, and to answer the question, do I have to submit all 30 of my courses? No, as we stated in the webinar, you have to submit examples of at least two courses, but if you happen to use all three delivery methodologies, synchronous, asynchronous, and hybrid blended, then you would need three. Um, another great question we have here is, um, what are some of the key differences between the 2018 standard and the 2023 standard? And when's the expected release date of the new standard? So I, I can take a stab at that, Karen, um, since I chaired the committee that uh, drafted the 2023 standard language. So the, the big change is a whole new numbering system and format. If you look at the 2018 standard, it's divided into nine categories and every 
of those categories has a number of so-called elements. In the 2023 format, there are seven sections um, and the content within those are called clauses and subclauses. Most of the work um, that was done was around wordsmithing to, in an attempt to make the requirement more clear, less ambiguous. Um, but there, there were what I'll, I'll call three substantive changes that providers are, are going to have to uh, review and determine whether they, they need to make any changes. And those are that um, CEUs will be able to be calculated to the hundredth versus the tenth. And the thinking there is that that gives a more uh, accurate metric of how much time is spent in the course. Uh, and it, it also caters to micro learning, you know, where maybe you're delivering uh, 15 or 20 minute uh, short bursts of learning. The second thing is that in your learning assessment, you will, will be required to have some method of assessment that um, is measurable and is also documented in some sort of record keeping system. So, you know, if your current method of assessment is, well, the instructor conducts a Q&A session and, and sort of gets a feel for how each individual has grasped the learning outcomes, that, that will no longer hold water. You, you really need some kind of more objective, measurable method. And then the third thing is that there are um, six very specific aspects of course evaluation that need to be measured. Um, and those are listed in the in the standard. Five of those six are already listed in the guidance for, in the 2018 application for um, category nine, how you evaluate learning events. So these are things like, um, you know, the, the competence of your instructor, did the course enable you to meet learning outcomes, quality of materials, quality of the learning environment and things like that. So it's possible that as you migrate to the 2023 standard, you may have to um, modify or expand your course evaluation. So, and to the timeline, um, right now, we, as Karen mentioned earlier, we are having our third request for comment period uh, that is open um, until May, I believe it's 27th, 28th, somewhere around there. Um, once that's done, th there has to be some administrative things that go on before we can submit that back to um, ANSI for their review. And just like, you know, all review cycles, there's no, um, depending on their workload and how fast they can get stuff back to us, there's no real um, concrete time that we can say. We're, we're really hoping, you know, if we get this done in May, end of May, request for comment, by the end of June, all of the review stuff will be ready and we'll be ready in July or August um, to release that 2023 standard and application. Uh, there will be a crosswalk. Um, I've already seen the draft of it from Karen and it's beautiful. Um, and we will be doing some town halls to help um, migrate people in transition from 2018 to 2023. So there'll be plenty of resources to assist you in making uh, those transitions. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, so another question we have here is, do processes and procedures need to be created for each department in the entire organization or just for the learning and development department? Primarily, it's for the learning and development department if they are the only ones that are responsible for the CEUs and for training and development. Um, we are just looking at you as the organization that oversees that responsibility. However, if your larger organization already has some policies in place, um, you do not have to recreate those policies, you can use your larger organization policies. Um, they don't have to be just relevant to your office, like uh, non-discrimination and, and things like that, that are a little more global. Um, but typically your processes are going to be within that department. Thank you. Um, 
So here's a great question. Uh, what is the value of accreditation? Is it just being part of ISET or are there other benefits? Do I need accreditation to award CEUs? Uh, I'll say that for the value of accreditation, from what I hear from our accredited providers is, number one is that they're finally documenting everything and they're collecting all of their uh forms and everything and getting it in a central location because a lot of the information goes in or it walks around in people's heads. And so a lot of our APs or accredited providers have told us that that's been one of the best things about going through accreditation is it helps them get organized. It also, once they start talking about these processes and policies, they start streamlining things and they to take out some of the redundancies and they also close the gaps on a lot of things of, of what they're doing. Um, the other thing is it's it it's like that um, a third party outside of your organization comes in and takes a look at your organization, an objective perspective, and th then they provide you some feedback. Some things you may not have even known or thought about, um, they can point that out. That's what our, a lot of times our commissioners will do. And the framework provides, as I said earlier, we're not going to tell you how to run your organization. We just say, based on research and best practices, these are the things that you should be doing to make sure that you're offering quality of learning events. It just helps make sure that you are doing all of these things, and it helps you go through your, um, your organization and just do a self-audit. Of where are we? What are we doing? And make sure that you're doing all of the right things. And then also it gives you kind of bragging rights when you are working with clients or other organizations to say that we are accredited. Somebody has come in and validated what we're doing. Um, so those are just a few. Oh, succession planning too. When you start documenting, you've got su succession planning in place. Um, and, you know, who knows? A uh, uh, a COVID or something comes along and really throws us all in for a loop when you have to start reorganizing and start retooling your organization to figure out how do we pivot to um, asynchronous learning or distance learning via Zoom. You've got all these questions that you need to be asking. And a lot of our providers told us that um, with the accredited, with the standard and with the processes that they had set up for accreditation, it helped them work through all that pretty pretty effectively. Yeah, I, I would I would echo the uh, credibility in the marketplace point. When I was running a continuing ed organization, um, we absolutely saw that um, once we were accredited, we were looked upon um, by our customers as being a more high quality continuing ed provider. So it, it either sets you apart from your competitors or if most of them happen to already be accredited, it puts you on par with them. And, and then the other thing I would add is that for my organization, it took the debate out of how we should do things. So, you know, if, if you have a staff of highly passionate educators or training professionals, they all have opinions good opinions about how things should be done. But here's what the standard says. And it just, you know, immediately eliminated all debate. Um, we stopped wasting time on all that. And, and it, it was just provided a very clear roadmap. Thank you so much. And um, we are near the end of the time. We still have some questions and I'm sorry, we can't get to all of your questions today. Uh, we do try to follow up afterwards. So if you have a question that we haven't gotten to, um, you know, Karen uh, will download the Q&A and download the chat and try to get with you and answer that question for you um, after after the webinar. So, uh, but I do want to take a few minutes here as before we end to just kind of talk about some next steps. Um, so first and foremost, if you haven't done so already, you, you'll want to, the next step is really to purchase the ANSI ISET standard and application. Um, this gets you access to the online resources to um, get you started on the um, the accreditation. So that's very important. Uh, we do highly recommend registering for a workshop. While it's not required, 
it is highly recommended. And then of course, the final step is to complete your application. And we say that as, as a bullet point, but that is the, but, but that's the real work. And that's gonna be the time consuming thing that you do, but you're not alone. We are here to help you complete that application. We do it first and foremost by providing you some great resources. So make sure once you buy the application under the resources uh, menu item, uh, the standard and application resources section tab there will unlock and you'll get access to just a whole heap of tools and documents. But we also have other things to assist you. We've talked a little bit about it already. The workshop um, is a great resource that you can come to and learn how to specifically answer the questions for the application and really make sure you're getting the background you need. As Karen told us earlier in the Q&A, um, applicants who attend the workshop have fewer findings, significantly fewer findings than applicants who don't attend the workshop. So there is a value there um, to come and do that. We do have uh, one coming up here in May, um, 21st. That's for our global audience. It's going to be run overnight for the U.S. audience. So do reckon, do see those um, time zone uh, changes uh, for that one. And then in June and July, it'll be our typical Amer um, Eastern time zone. Uh, one of those is in person in um, Vienna, Virginia. So we hope to see you there. Another resource we have available for you uh, every month, we do a complimentary uh, meeting, what we're calling an ISAT Accreditation Assistance Forum. And if you have a specific question about your specific application, you can come to one of these 45-minute sessions, talk to Karen and one of our commissioners about your specific question on, hey, how, what do you want me, what do you, how do you want me to answer question 32? Um, on the application. Uh, I'm just a little confused there, and you'll get some great guidance. Um, outside of accreditation, uh, we do have other resources available to you. We have an open digital workshop uh, that's coming up here at the end of May. If your organization is interested in or is implementing um, open digital badging, uh, you can come learn how to do it in a way that aligns with the standard, um, in a way that will uh, set you up for success in your creating and implementing your open digital badging program. And I'm also excited to announce that we are going to be live in Charlotte, North Carolina for the first ever ISET uh, symposium, where we're gonna explore the idea of, of how to use artificial intelligence in uh, continuing education and training. So lots of great learning opportunities for you, some directly related uh, to accreditation and some that just align with our standard. Um, as always, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you're reaching obstacles, don't hesitate to contact us. We are your accreditation guides to help you be successful on your accreditation journey. Thank you so much for uh, attending, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all join us as ISET accredited providers.